During that time, I worked in uh, San Francisco. We had merged with another hospital, Navy hospital that had closed. And so we picked up a lot of Navy residents. These guys had these incredible stories of traveling the world before they even became surgeons. They had been general medical officers. They've been to Midway. They've been to Guam. They've been to Singapore. Uh, no one else had those kinds of stories. Yeah. And when I was considering it, they, they asked me, said, Ramon, do you want to pull in the same parking spot every day for 30 years? And I said, no, no, I don't. Welcome to another edition of TM3 Impact. My name is Tomas Martinez. Today, here we go. We have Ramon Sestero, Dr. MBA. He is the chief medical officer and co-founder for ASR Systems. He's also a professor of surgery at UT Health. Ramon, welcome. Well, thanks for having me. Yes, man. I'm super pumped. You know, we... We always run into each other at amazing parties. We it do. just seems like, you know, we run into each other at parties. And every time I'm like, I got to get you on the show. It's uh, time. I appreciate it's time. It. So I'm excited for you here. So let's start off. Cliff Note version. Tell me, how did you come to live in this amazing city, San Antonio? Well, uh, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a surgeon. I'm a trauma surgeon here in San Antonio. But I was active duty Navy for 10 years. And so that took me around the U.S., around the world. Finally ended up uh, doing my trauma training in Los Angeles, and my duty station after that was uh, San Antonio, Texas. Right from school? Uh, right from, I was already a surgeon. You were already, so, okay. Uh, you, I went through residency, and then I went through specialized training in trauma surgery. And after that, then I was active duty, and so okay. they found me a location here to, to work. So I worked with the uh, Institute of Surgical Research and, and uh, uh, BAMSI. Uh, for a few years. So what year was that? Did you get here? So we that? ended up here in 2010. Okay, yeah. yeah. That's right before we started Luxury Hill Magazine. Yeah, because you yep. started in 11. Right? Yep, we started yep. in 2011. Yep. Yeah, so 2010, you get to San Antonio. Yep. At that point, how long had you been? It, your, it, was your military career just starting? No, I'd already been active duty. So I finished my uh, surgery training in 2003. Okay. Uh, went active duty, finished my training pretty much the next day. I'm on a plane to Kuwait. To yeah. Join my ship. Did uh, several tours. I did a couple tours in Iraq. Uh, I was uh, overseas for a bit doing other things. And uh, finally went back for specialized training after general surgery in Los Angeles for two years. And then after that, uh, came to San Antonio. And then you came to San Antonio. Well, again, U.S. Navy, thank you for your service. Really appreciate that. And again, San Antonio gets an amazing person, amazing family from the military. Military City USA. Yeah. Love it. That's fantastic. That's why I'm here. Yeah. My dad was Army 23 years. Right. And he retired out of San He came here, retired. And loved it. He fell in love with San Antonio. Yeah, it's a great city in general, but for military, it's uh, actually it provides extra bonus. It's huge. So let's go back because I'm I'm always curious when I have someone with, with the amount of schooling that you've had. I I want to go back to young Ramon. Like let's go back in the day because I'm always curious. Is like how did you envision your life at you know when you were in middle school? How did you envision your life? Did you see your life being a doctor? Like tell me about that young Ram Ramon just growing up. Yep. So I grew up in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Okay. Uh, left, I was left there when I was about nine. Um, but during you know middle school, uh, junior high, high school, when so I, we moved to California, um, I've always I've always enjoyed math and science. Uh, coming from a family of physicians, my dad was an OBGYN, his dad was an OBGYN. So I always had a vision of medicine. Um, again, I enjoyed the sciences. I did well at them. And so I, I always kind of thought I would end up being a physician. Um, Interesting. So I did. From a young age, so your so your grandfather was a was an OBGYN, yep. and then your dad was correct. And what about your family, brothers, sisters? I have one brother. Uh, he is not medical. Um, yeah, he's a controller for a uh, a small size company. Okay, um, so he's in the business side. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so gr now I so growing up with your dad being a doctor, tell me about that as a young, you know, middle school, high school guy, like. I mean, were grades big? Was that a pressure? Was it was grades like super big deal? Tell me about that. Well, uh, you know, uh, having a physician father, you get to see what that life is like. And as an OBGYN, solo practice, you know, he's he was on the pager, uh, you know, before cell phones, obviously. Yes. Uh, everywhere we went, and so we were used to dinners being cut short or outings being cut short because he had to go to the hospital and deliver a baby. Yeah. And so you, you learn to appreciate the sacrifices that come with uh, medical school and, and being a physician. 
Uh, as far as the grades, I, I, I always did fairly well in, in, um, in math and science and, and, and the rest of the sciences. I, I, uh, so that, that was really a big issue for me. But yeah. you do know it's competitive uh, yeah. once you get to the you know, undergrad and then medical school. And so uh, I w- always did concentrate on the on our grade on my grades. On your grades. So you get out of high school. Did you do pretty well in high school? Yeah. So now we're in California. We left Puerto Rico in yeah. 79 or so. Okay. And so I did my junior high or, or elementary junior high um, in high school in Southern California. Okay. Uh, I did well. Yeah. I ended up, um, you know, I think, number one in my class. Are you a valedictorian? Uh, at the time I applied, yes. Get out of here. Yeah. That's stinking awesome. Then I, then I let it slide. Any- <laughs> So, okay, no, not, <laughs> not so much. But, but. Yeah, I, I, I doubt that highly since you're a trauma surgeon. I doubt that. But but you were valid for 20 years school. Uh, I was. That's thinking cool. That's very, very cool. Okay, so go to college. And then what was college life like for you? Were you like serious? Because... Because I would imagine as coming out, because if you were valedictorian in high school, you, like you were in it, like you you knew what you wanted, what you were going for, you know it. So when you get to college, was there almost like this where you wanted to kind of relax a little bit? Like what was that that thinking when you first started college? No, it's actually the opposite. Now you attend a college, which is uh, also competitive. So you may have been number one in your school, in your high school, but now you're just a number uh, at the next level. And so you have to hit the books even harder. Uh, so I, I was, it was very humbling to, you know, get to, uh, I went to UC San Diego, a, yeah. a challenging school. Um, a lot of number ones from, you know, from everywhere, the, from everywhere. <laughs> and so you basically have to hit the books even harder because to get into medical school, then that it's, it's another level. Um, and you knew you wanted to go medical. You knew right from the minute you joined the, or when you got into uh, college, you knew high school, you knew. Uh, I was pretty sure. Okay. Uh, I, you know, I, I worked at a hospital. I, I had a you know, physician father. I, I didn't, you know, I interviewed other uh, physicians to see what the lifestyle's like. I, I had a pretty good idea of what I was getting myself into. Yeah. And so I, I was fairly sure I was end up uh, being a physician. Okay. Interesting. Um, obviously, I, I, you know, I've looked at your LinkedIn, right? And it, you're, I can sense uh, type A energy. Like you're just, you're, 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 mo- where does, where does this motivation come from? We're like, like dig deep. Like, where did this come from? You know, uh, I, I like challenges. Um, I, I like achieving goals. Um, and I've always just, uh, set goals for myself. And so well, once I achieve one, I find another one. You just pick another goal. What's the next one? So college, you get through your, 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 uh, uh bachelor's and now it's on a medical school, school at, uh, California, yep. San Diego, yep. right? Stay, stayed at the same school. Stayed at the same school from, for your first part of medical school. No, I did uh, my entire medical school there. So undergrad okay. at UC San Diego, and then I went to UC San Diego Medical School. As well. Okay, tell me about medical school. What was that like for you? It's the, again another level. Um, so now you have uh, some of the smartest individuals I, I've ever met, um, and so it, it becomes even more challenging to be successful uh, mm. in school. And so uh, you know you study every day, every day you go to class all day, uh, you go work out for an hour, and then you study till eleven o'clock midnight, and you repeat it the next day. You do that for a couple years straight. Uh, mm. It was it was quite the sacrifice. Uh, if somebody is listening to this and they have a young one that's thinking about medical school, what would you tell them right now? Um, it's more than just medical school. It's uh, you know you have to look at what your life is going to be like as a physician. Um, the uh, time commitments that are involved, the schooling that's involved, the cost that's involved. You really need to take a look at the big picture. It's not as it was 20, 30 years ago mm. where you can be assured of a fairly uh, nice lifestyle when you're done. Uh, now it's, uh, you know, the uh, the income isn't what it used to be. The uh, challenges with electronic medical records, the time you spend on a computer versus with patients is very different. Mm. It's a it's an entire different uh, practice of medicine now as it was when I first started. It. So it could almost be a little bit of a negative in, in a sense, because what, what the changes? Not so much a negative. Yeah. You just have to go eyes wide open. Adapt. Uh, ad- okay. So, so a lot of people think, I want to be a doctor. Yeah. And they say, I want to go to medical school. And then they learn once they're well into that path, and it's hard to change from that path. Once you've committed you know, your, your medical school, your costs, uh, all the time you spend into it, not a lot of other careers you can do out of, out of medical school. True. And so uh, I, I spent a lot of time explaining all of it 
when I when I get asked about uh, being a physician. Yeah. Okay. That, that that definitely makes sense. So, when did the Navy come into the picture? At what point were you like, okay, I need? I, I, you were looking at this. Was that in college or bachelor's or in medical school? No, I had really no relationship to the military prior to uh, residency. So that's after medical school. Oh, wow. So undergrad then medical school, and now you're in residency where you're actually you're a physician. Yep. And now you're doing your training, whatever specialty you selected. So I was in surgery for seven years. Okay. And so during that time, I worked in um, in San Francisco. We had merged with another hospital, uh, Navy hospital that had closed. And so we picked up a lot of Navy residents. And okay. so these guys uh, and, and women had all had these incredible stories of traveling the world before they even became surgeons. And so they had been general medical officers. They'd been to Midway. They'd been to Guam. They'd been to you know, uh, Singapore. And it was really impressive. Uh, no one else had those kinds of stories. Yeah. And, and I remember they, when I was considering it, they they asked me. Said they said one of guy one of my friends, said Ramon, do you want to pull in the same parking spot every day for thirty years? And I said no, no, I don't. And so uh, the Navy and any military certain military branch gives you a variety. Um, yeah. You tend to move pretty frequently. You, you know, as your your family is military. It just gives you variety. Every few years, you you learn something new. You meet new people. You live in a new place, even a foreign country. And so uh, that was really attractive to me. And so I signed up when I was in residency. So th- so being at a Navy hospital, that's kind of the... Was it a Navy hospital? Is that what you say? Or was it a former Navy hospital? No, it was, was a civilian Navy hospital I trained in. Okay. Had, uh, there was a... Um, nearby Navy facility. Got it. Okay. That closed. And so their residents had to finish their residency and they merged with our program. They, so you're working alongside other Navy doctors and physicians in residency. Correct. Interesting. So before that moment, it, was anybody in your family military? My father was, uh, he was Army Reserves. He was uh, Army. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So he probably got out pretty young then. Yeah, he was reserves, so yeah. usually two, you know, one week in a month, two weeks a year. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but so he retired as reserves. No, he did it just okay. a few years of that. Okay, got it, got it. But before that, anybody else? Any brother, sister? I mean, no. No, your brother? No, no, nobody. Interesting. So I, I, I'm, I'm imagining this had to be. So when you made the decision for the Navy, what year was that? Was this twenty? It's ninety six. Oh, it was ninety six. Okay, so 96, okay, I mean, in, in, in terms of where we were at, that was kind of, no, 92 was the per- Persian Gulf War, right? That was yes. 92, so it was just kind of the tail They've end. They've been wrapping up. Okay, so in 96, I'm imagining you, like, you're kind of talking with the family. At this time, were you married? No. Not married. What, so you go to your dad, and you're like, hey, I'm thinking about the Navy. Tell me about that conversation. They said, that's great. He was he was all in. Absolutely. All in. I love it. So when did you go to sign up and you finally were like, I'm, I'm in, I'm going into the Navy? So the process typically involves some interviews um, and uh, you they fly you out to a hospital where you can meet some of the physicians you'd be working with, ask about the Navy lifestyle, et cetera. Yeah. And then once you agree, you get commissioned. And so you pick up... Uh, you know, I picked up a, I think, lieutenant rank. Yeah. And so you go through a small training program, um, and you become a Navy officer. Now Boom. you go right back to your residency program, so you're protected from any deployment. Okay. Uh, during that time. Yeah. Uh, there is a stipend involved, so it kind of helps you financially. And then when you're done uh, with your training, now you're a fully boarded surgeon. Uh, now you go off and do training, learning how to salute, how to put on a uniform, all the basics of the military. It uh, takes about six weeks. Okay, okay. Uh, officer indoctrination training, officer yeah. candidate school, whatever um, different services call it, different things. Yeah. And then uh, so I went through that and uh, took my board's exams. And the day after my board's exams, I got on a plane to Kuwait. You were on your way to Kuwait. To join my ship, which is already wow. deployed. Wow, wow. So was that were, was there... Was there any hesitation to joining? Yeah, to joining. You know, I I, I spoke with a lot of my uh, uh, fellow uh, surgery residents that had been in for a while. They told me the good and the bad. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not um, it's not all roses. Right. Of course. In the military, uh, yeah. you, you do belong to the U.S. government. Um, yeah. And you have you have zero control of where you go, when you go, and, and how you how you get there. Yeah. And so uh, I that didn't that didn't bother me. Um, so there was. There wasn't really, once I decided there was no hesitation. That makes sense. Okay, yeah. I, I'm. You know what's coming back to me is what you said earlier. That idea that do you want to show up to the same parking space for thirty years? That like that hit me. It's depressing. That would, <laughs> that would be massively depressing. Yeah. 
but there, there are plenty of people that do that. Yeah. And so, and that's fine. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I just, uh, I, I enjoy the variety of the military. Yeah. That's, I, I, I love that. Okay. So now you, you, you go to your first, you said you're on your first deployment. What was that? Your first deployment? Like you're, you were sent off to your, which ship were you on? Uh, Do you remember that ship probably that vividly? That was uh, the USS Peleliu, which okay. is no longer in service. It okay. was an uh, amphibious uh, uh, warship. Uh, really, it's uh, called the Gator Freighter. What it does is really transports Marines across the coast. Okay. So we had a whole set of Marines with us um, with uh, tanks and howitzers and Marine officers. And so um, it, it was really interesting. You know, you there are programs where you can actually learn about the ship and get a pin, it's called. Yeah. It's, a, it's a certificate, essentially. Yeah. So you learn about the electronics, the defense systems, the all the combat vehicles that are being transported, learn about the Harriers, learn about how the ship works, how the Navy works. So there is a lot of downtime when you're out at sea. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you, can, you can spend that time, um, you know, uh, fairly uh, uh, productively. I would imagine, yeah. So, what your your big thing was learning about the military, or would you read? What was what was your downtime, kind of like uh, the deal that you would you would turn to? Well, so you you you're living it, um, but uh, the the programs that that kind of educate you on on how the Navy works. Okay. Uh, because remember, I, I just came out of a civilian residency program, and now I'm a I'm a O three or, or an officer or lieutenant, and so you're expected to know something about the Navy when they see their rank on your shoulder. But yeah. from Everybody comes in from the medical side, usually does civilian training, and, and we know, we don't know very much. Yeah, and so uh, you do have to get up to speed uh, just on on how the Navy functions. Uh, but you know, there's a Navy side where it's, uh, you're at shore or you're you're out at sea. Very different. Navies. It's a different. Yeah. And oh, so, interesting. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Okay, I get the sense too that leadership has has played a major role in your career. Right. And, and because I know at one point you were a, a commander at one point in, in your career. And I'm just curious, like from beginning of your military career, what did you think about leadership? And then as you were closing out your career and retiring in, 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 in military, what was leadership at that point and kind of compare and contrast it to? Yeah. So I think when you're younger, you just don't appreciate uh, the importance of good leaders. Unless you've really been exposed to them, um, and what I what I mean by that is, uh, we kind of go through our day. We all have we all have a boss uh, at some at some point, but uh, that boss can can just kind of get through the day, or they can inspire you, they can they can mold you, they can educate you, they can help you, and that is a that's very different. Um, and you know, uh, uh, there's a quote uh, that I always uh, I'm impressed by is people don't leave their jobs, they leave their boss. And so, um, you know, to compare from the beginning of my military career to the end, you know, that that's a long career. I mean, I, I did three combat zones. I was in charge of all the trauma for a NATO hospital. So I had international surgeons under me. I had 300 people uh, that I managed. Um, and so doing that in a combat environment, high stress environment, people away from their families, uh, you, you appreciate the importance uh, and the value that, mm. that your employees or, or your um, uh or whoever you're leading, kind of, they take from that. And so, um, you know, that's one of the reasons I, I didn't want to end up doing an MBA and, and formalize some of that leadership. Because yeah. you, you, you have experiential leadership from the military side, at least I did. And then I wanted to, to use some of that on my civilian side. Um, and so the MBA was very helpful. Yeah, I could totally see that. So the, from... Did you, you said you, in the, in the beginning, you didn't appreciate it as much? Well, or just, is it, you just don't even notice? Is it about a lack of... You know, like a, a lack of uh, just, you know, almost, you know, you're naive to it. Yeah. Well, until you have several bosses, uh, yeah. several people above you, and then you can start comparing what do you like, what you didn't like, why I prefer working for this individual versus that individual. You just don't know. You don't yeah. know what's a good leader. Um, and, and it's not really stressed so much as when you're young, starting off in any profession. You learn to appreciate that, I think, through experience, both no, good and bad. For sure. Okay, so, so trauma surgery. When I, when I, 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 I wanted to uh, kind of brush up and just kind of understand and, and kind of get a, a basic idea. So I was kind of looking up a little bit. And, and your residency for trauma surgery, it, it seems like it's a lot longer than what a normal residency would be. Right? Is it is it is it longer? Or am I did I miss that? It is. So um, not not uh, significantly longer. It's only a couple of years. A couple so, years. Yeah. Uh, standard uh, training for a general surgeon is five years. Okay. Uh, mine was seven because I also did research, 
and that added a couple of years. And then if you want to subspecialize, whether you want to become a colorectal surgeon or a vascular surgeon or a trauma surgeon, it requires going back and being a fellow. Oh, that's right. Oh, you do a fellowship afterwards. Okay, and yes. usually those are between one or two years. So I did okay. two years in L.A., uh, L.A. County, very busy trauma hospital. And that was more of the formalized training for trauma surgery and critical care. Yeah. And so when I was looking at this trauma, so, I was, you know, they, they, they call it blunt trauma, right? Or, or, or uh, it could be gunshots. It could be stab wounds. It could be immediate trauma where you've got to go in there with a lot, not a lot of information and then kind of figure things out. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I sat there, I was just like, man, that sounds like being a doctor on steroids. Like that's, that's a, there's a problem solving to that, that you can't just figure out on the job. Like you got to really train for this. So when you are like, well, I guess there is a lot of on the job, but how do you really start to learn how to problem solve in that way for trauma surgery? Well, uh, you know, it's just uh, making decisions with limited information. And so I think most of us do that every day, depending on what we do. There are a lot of high pressure, other high pressure professions that you don't have all the information, but you have to make a decision. And it's, it's no different in medicine hmm. uh, or trauma surgery. Uh, most of the time, our patients, uh, we meet them on their worst day, uh, unfortunately. Uh, sometimes they can't even speak to us and give us information about their history, their medications, their previous surgeries. And so uh, you, just, you just work with what you have. And so um, uh, you kind of process it on, on the fly. Uh, it comes with experience like any other job. And so the more you do it, the better you get at it. Yeah. I can imagine, was there ever, obviously in your general surgery, you're getting used to the fact that you're opening people up. Like you've got to do what you got to do. Was there ever a moment in the beginning where you're like, I'm not sure I want to do this like <laughs> well, I mean is there ever you know what I mean like I'm just thinking because I, I saw one of the surgeries that they they have online where they're using the 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 uh ASR system the Titan is it the Titan is that what you call it the Titan the Titan. Mm -hmm. and and I was watching this and I literally thought to myself like okay that's really interesting <laughs> I can't imagine but there has to be an adaption of your mind to get used to that right um, you know, through uh, undergrad and you do labs and you use maybe some cadavers and you do more of that in medical school, you, you get accustomed to the body and, and, and the body cavities and operating on the body cavities and exposing tissues. And so if you decide that is not for you, then, then you hopefully don't go into surgery. Yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> so once you go into surgery uh, and you do abdominal surgery, you're usually uh, pre-screened uh, for accepting that. Okay. And so you're pretty used to it. Now, you asked me if there were times I, I rethought my career choice. Yeah. Um, you know, but when I was doing residency, it was, it was before we had, we have limits now on 80 hour work weeks for residents. There were no limits uh, when I trained. So my average work week is about 120 hours. Wow. Uh, I wouldn't see the sun outside uh, other than through a window for, for weeks at a time. Uh, I'd come in at three in the morning, leave at eight o'clock the next day at night. Oh, my And then come gosh. back at three o'clock. So we, we worked excessive hours uh, during that time. Uh, so there were days where I reconsidered my career choice. I'm glad those days are done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And now, now residency training is uh, much more manageable with uh, hour limits. Okay. And how? I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around a 120-hour work week. And you did that for two years? How, long, how many uh, years? No, you did that, I did that for five years. For five years. That's interesting. And now they can't, they can't do 120. They have to do 80. Now, now we have limits on it. They have it. limits on it. Yeah. That's, pro that's probably better. Yeah. Just I for would agree. <laughs> mental would stability. Agree. Yeah. All right. You're, now, as you go along your military career, are there highlights of people who mentored you that really stand out? Yeah. There's, uh, I had several bosses that um, really um, stood out in terms of uh, just caring for their people, which okay. is really what. what uh, you know, the bottom line of being a good boss, I think, is you just find out what your people want and then provide it, and they'll do a good job for you or what they need, right? And so uh, I had, I've had good bosses, I've had not so good bosses, and I've had uh, bosses that really shouldn't have been in those positions. Yeah. Um, so I learned from all of them, and so I, that's what I was saying earlier about about experiential, uh, you know, leadership is uh, the more you the more you change jobs or have different people above you, the more you learn about yeah. what, how to do it well, how not to do it well. Yeah. So you, you, one of your deployments, you go with the SEAL team, you know, uh, uh, which, what year was that? Uh, that was several times. Uh, so we, you know, in the, in the Navy, we, we provide the medical support for the Navy and the Marine Corps. Okay. 
and occasionally uh, SEAL teams are, 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 are working in remote environments. And yeah. so we have small teams that can go out there and support them uh, because they just don't have any quick access to a, a, a medical facility. And so uh, we operate on ships, we operate in vehicles, we operate you know, wherever we're needed. Um, yeah. And so I, I did a couple of those deployments. And what was, I mean, working, because, you know, there's a, there's, there's a mystique to this, the SEALs. There's a mystique to this idea. David Goggins has really, you know, he shined a big light on it. And have you heard, you've heard of David Goggins, I would imagine. He, he was a Navy SEAL and, and turned, you know, ultra athlete, you know, d- does these crazy races. The, 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 he did the Bad Water, which is a 135-mile race through Death Valley. And, and he, during his time in the Navy, one of the things, he was a recruiter, but he was a Navy SEAL. Uh, but... There's this, there's this idea of the SEALs, and I would imagine that, I mean, you didn't have a ton of military uh, uh, experience prior to that, so now you're getting deployed with the Navy SEALs. What was that like? Oh, I don't, I don't want uh, to give the perception that I was alongside the Navy SEALs, because that's not the case. No, so we... we uh, well, you were in a medical component. Yeah, we work yeah. up a platform, but they're, they're a different breed and a different level altogether. So we, we basically provide medical support, but at the level we can support it. And so, uh, you know, we are we're in remote areas, uh, but we're not out there, you know, uh, on a hilltop. Uh, right. Understand. Know, typically, they, they, they come to us. They come. They find yeah, you they quickly. <laughs> yeah. But what I mean, what was it like working with the, the SEALs? What was that like? Uh, they're they're extremely professional. Uh, them and the Marine Corps. You know, one of the things I did enjoy about the military because you get these different units and, di- and different ways they work, different cultures. Yeah. Um, Navy SEALs, everyone I've met is just professional, uh, direct, um, just uh, an expert in what they do. Yeah. Um, Marines uh, also uh, very direct. Uh, you know, you, you know where you stand with them uh, whenever you're working with them. There, there is no, you know, um, it's a one or a zero relationship. Oh, interesting. Uh, so it, I really enjoyed that. It's very clear. Yeah. Uh, is and, the one or a zero? I like you or I don't like you. Is or that what you're <laughs> doing? This you're not doing this. You know? I love, but you know where you stand though. Exactly. You know what I mean? So it's not like, it's not up for debate. Yep. It's like, I know where, I know where I stand with you. You know what I mean? We can move forward now. Again, you make decisions with limited information. That's right. That's right. So throughout your military, your, your seven deployments, right? Throughout your deployments, the, the one that I saw that really stood out, right? Is that NATO, right? Where you were there in, in, in Afghanistan. And that was, you were there for a year. Was that right? About Th- that one was eight months. Um, eight. my tour in Iraq, um, was, I did two tours back to back. Okay, and so that was at a called a Roll Two, which is a tent like facility. Okay, uh, it was in Fallujah. It was a very busy time. Um, it was a, during the second push in Fallujah. Okay, and so uh, supporting the Marines, and so we were very busy for the first seven months. Uh, during my deployment, they asked for volunteers to come back and do a second deployment, um, and I, I volunteered. They needed they need individuals, and so I came home for two weeks and then returned back for another seven months. Wow. So, so you were, so almost over a year, I mean, over, over a year in Iraq. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, I guess at that time, is this from a, you know, trauma surgeon, are you seeing pretty much everything at that point there in Iraq? Yes. You're seeing everything. So, um, you know, the, um, when Marines go in and and clear out of town, uh, you can only imagine the injuries as they, as they, you know, use their howitzers and their M4s. And I mean, there's, there's penetrating injury left and right. Uh, a lot of IED injuries as well, um, yeah. you know, from uh, roadside patrols or, or vehicles rolling over IEDs. And so uh, we saw the whole gamut there. Mm. So then NATO, what was, uh, how did that uh, experience get you ready for NATO in leading at NATO, which would have been how many years later? That was uh, four years. About later. four years later. What explain those two experiences? Because in one, you were you were uh, you were an active surgeon, I would imagine, in, in in Iraq, and now at NATO, you're kind of running you're running that entire base for all of these. So, talk about the difference between those two deployments. Yeah, so, in in Iraq, it was a small facility. There are only three other surgeons. Oh wow! Um, so it, it's a small unit. Okay. Uh, and in Afghanistan, it was a, a NATO facility, so 300 plus um, medical personnel. Um, a, a, we'd been there for eight, nine, ten years by that point, so the facility was well established. It's okay. a it's a hospital they built specifically for trauma. Okay. Um, so very mature, very developed uh, system by the time I arrived. 
And so, um, you know, my job was really management of trauma and, and any, any clinical uh, um, uh, issues that came up. But I also operated during that time. And you did uh, as my surgery as well. Yep. Yeah. And and at that time, what was what was the temperature in, in what was going on at that time in Afghanistan? That's was 2010, 2011? That was 2012 12? at Because that, that was, a, what, so uh, Osama bin Laden was killed, what was it, in 11? That was around. The 11 or 12, somewhere around there. So the temperature had to be pretty, was it pretty hot at that point in Afghanistan? Yeah, the you know, the... Osama bin Laden death didn't affect uh, operations out oh, there so much. It was still just it was it was very busy. It's very uh, busy, it, which is yeah. So I mean, I I would imagine what was it like from a leadership standpoint, leading other surgeons from other countries? Because now you have cultural, we have the cultural expectation in the U.S. Uh, of of. And, 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 and I'll be curious to see what you think about this, because there's there's almost like, OK, your title in the U.S. is kind of like, OK, I well, your title is this. And so I have a level of respect. I'm curious if that plays as much over in other countries in, in what you found leading these surgeons from other other places. That was a little bit of a challenge. Um, everybody spoke English. Uh, so that, that was fortunate as far as communication. But you learn that the training is very different from uh, U.S. versus non-U.S. And mm. so U.S., mm. we're a very violent country. Um, you know, most trauma surgeons uh, have a lot of experience with gunshot wounds, uh, rifles. Um, uh, so if you come from a, another country that doesn't allow guns, you don't They've have never that experience. Seen it. Or minimal experience. Wow. And now you're thrown into a combat zone where that experience is important. Right. And so uh, some of it was just getting some of those surgeons up to speed, um, you know, working alongside them. Um, now, many of those surgeons work in South Africa and other parts of the world um, where they did get that training. Okay. But the U.S. surgeons typically just unfortunately actually have that, have more of that penetrating injury experience. So there's a lot of working alongside, very team oriented. It was, it was, uh, you know, I learned as much from them as they probably did for, uh, from us. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it had, it presented its own challenges. What do you think was the biggest challenge other than their inexperience with, with, you know, penetrating wounds and, in in blunt for, well, I, I would, they, I probably, they probably have some blunt force trauma. They, they've, they've seen that, but, but from a leadership perspective, what do you think was the biggest issue that you had to overcome? Um, you know, Different militaries work differently. So mm. you it's just like a different culture in each one. And now when you have three or four different countries all thrown together under one flag, uh, there, there can be, you know, some challenges there. But, you know, everybody, the mission is uh, taking care of the patient or the soldier. And so in the majority of the time, that was the focus. Um, and as long as you redirect uh, your personnel to that, then every problem can be solved. And they were, you were able to overcome it. Absolutely. Yeah. And so after, uh, uh, as you're wrapping up your career, uh, uh, it, you, you, you obviously begin teaching, you begin training. At what point did you start teaching um, in your career? For you know, the most Navy. trauma surgeons work at level one or the highest level trauma centers, and those tend to be academic. So you usually have residents. So most of us, if you go into trauma, have been teaching for a long time. Okay. We, we teach when we're residents because we're all, it's always a team. Okay. Uh, there's no trauma surgeon or any general surgeon that works on their own. So you've got uh, interns, re junior residents, senior residents, uh, physician assistants, nurses. It's it's a big team that that manages trauma patients. So you're 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 teaching pretty much your entire career. Which yeah. is probably, if you think about it, the best way to do it. Yeah. Right? Because you're constantly seeing new techniques, new opportunities to learn. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, uh, there's a lot of other areas where we don't do that and we should. I was a teacher for 11 years. Yeah, that's right. Right? And, yeah. and I, don't, I, I just don't think we get, once you become a teacher, I don't think the training after that is really, it's just yeah. not great. No, and, and you're right. Unfortunately. You know, uh, you know, we have a new class of medical students every year, and, and they'd keep you on your toes because they would ask you questions where uh, a new medication that you hadn't heard about or, or, uh, mm. or something that was new. And so now you're like, I, I, I didn't know that. Uh, let me go. Let's, why don't you teach me? Uh, and so, uh, and these wouldn't be major advancements, but there's always new medication that comes out. Um, you know, there's hundreds of medications yeah. coming out, and you can't keep up with them all. Yeah, there's no way. And, and so, but having uh, um, trainees keeps you on your toes and, and keeps you active. 
Do all medical uh, uh, doctors have that same, uh, do they all go through that where they're constantly in a state of training and teaching almost every field? Every residency program is, is set up for that. Okay. Uh, so you come in as a junior, as an intern in your first year, and you... Um, and you start learning about whatever field you went into, and you become when you become your second year, uh, you enter your second year. Now you learn a little more. Now you teach the intern, and so uh, it's a constant um, educational process yeah. uh, to go through a residency program. What let's what, uh, let's say you get to year 10, 12 as a you know after you've gotten graduate you've graduated uh, a trauma surgeons that have that have been out of the field for a really long time. They still fold into all of this teaching. They're still helping out. Well, if they're, you know, if they're an academic center, they're just always exposed to trainees. Okay. And so you're always teaching. You're all, okay, there you go. That makes sense. So if you're, like, you're in a, even if you're in a hospital, let's say no matter what hospital you go to, there are going to be interns there that you're going to be working alongside in training. If it's, an, if it's a teaching hospital. If it's a teaching interns. hospital. If it's a private hospital, you probably won't. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So you wrap up your military career and... Um, what was that like when you finally were like you were you were you were retiring? Because I know for everybody it feel, it's a little different feel. Um, I remember going to my dad's retirement. My dad had been in the military twenty three years. It had taken him out of he had moved to New York from Puerto Rico mm -hmm. when he was eight in the middle of winter. He mm -hmm. he arrives in in New York and he ends up getting out of the city and, and joining the military. He saved his life and then you know here he is retiring. And I remember seeing my dad, and, and it was probably the most nervous I've ever seen my dad, because he he really didn't know what he was going to do next. What was that experience like for you in your retirement and kind of going through that process? Well, mine was more of a gradual retirement, so I did 10 years active duty. I, and as you mentioned, I, I, yeah. I did seven deployments. I raised my hand as much as I could. And, uh, you know, after having a couple of close calls and deployment with, in the combat zone, I, I decided I'm going to, I'm going to stop. And so I left active duty, transferred to the reserves and did that for 10 years. And so as a reservist, you're, you're really, you know, you're not as actively involved. It's uh, one week in a month, uh, two weeks a year. And so I did that for 10 years. Okay. I retired with a combination active duty and, and, um, and reservist. So for me, it was it was kind of gradual. I still, you know, being in being here in San Antonio, I still teach, uh, you know, military surgeons. I teach for the Air Force uh, how to do austere medicine in Camp Bolas. Uh, I teach, uh, you know, uh, trauma courses for military still. So I'm still engaged with the military. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, I just, I'm not, I'm not. I don't belong to the military anymore. Right. There you go. There you go. Yeah. And, and, and so the, in that time period, while you were a, a, as a, as a, where you were, um, in the reserves, right. You were during that time period. Is this where the idea for this device that you created? Cause now you, you go, I, the, now the story that I hear is when you were teaching and doing trauma surgery, you decided to get your MBA. True. And when, when, so tell me about, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, like, you've had enough school, Ramon. Like it, I'm just thinking, why are you going to go get your MBA? And you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but you were, to, walk me through that. You, you had been a doctor for how long at this point? Oh, um, 15 years. So th this, is, this wasn't recent, right? Your MBA was how long ago? Uh, about seven years ago. About seven years ago. So you're, you're, you're working, trauma surgeon. Mm -hmm. And then you are in the meantime, during that whole time, getting an MBA. Correct. Explain that to people so we understand. So, um, you know, uh, you talked about open surgery earlier, uh, abdominal surgery. And so that's a lot of what we do on deployments. And, and trauma surgery is a lot of abdominal surgery. Um, and we use uh, tools, uh, you know, metal devices to get tissues out of the way so I can use my hands. If I'm, if I'm using my hands to get uh, the intestine out of the way so I can uh, reach the kidney, I can't use my hands to sew or take out the kidney, whatever I need to do. So we use metal devices that have been around for hundreds of, well, probably at least 100 years. So one of the devices that we use uh, was invented over 100 years ago. Um, it's not very good. Uh, and there's, there's other devices that have been developed, but really are two types. And one's invented 40 years ago and one's 100 years ago. Wow. The one we use on deployment uh, was invented over 100 years ago, and it's not very effective. So I found myself several times, uh, either in Iraq or Afghanistan, operating on the most severely injured casualty I've ever worked on from an explosion or a rifle round or whatever it might be. 
and I'm in a tent. Uh, I'm in, and I have bad lighting. I don't have a lot of help. I don't have a lot of blood products. I'm limited in every way. And I have a hundred year old device. And so I felt that, um, we were placed at a disadvantage every yeah. time I deploy. And so whenever I'd come home from a deployment, I was just very frustrated about the equipment that were issued. And so, um, unfortunately there's no better equipment really in the civilian hospital. There's just more hands. Um, more, and so yeah. I, I decided why can't I create something better merging a couple of the systems we already use, uh, into a better, uh, composite. And so that's what I did. Once I separated from the military, I, I teamed up with the university of Texas. Well, most of the universities, larger universities have programs where they tap into faculty's ideas. Um, uh, Gatorade was one of those. Uh, oh yeah. Out, Interesting. Right, right? I didn't uh, know that. Yep. And so, um, they have similar uh, programs here, and I submitted my concept. Uh, they found it was patentable, uh, commercial, or c- it could be commercialized, and so um, found some grant money, developed some prototypes, and it worked. Um, wow. What and, year was that? With it, that it, was 2014 or so. 14, okay. Yep. And so uh, you know, a company actually uh, licensed the product. Uh, they were going to develop it, then they ran into some financial issues. So they returned the license to the University of Texas, and they asked me to form a company. And so uh, at that point, I'd, I'd, I had ideas this might turn into a, into a commercial venture. And so I started with an MBA, uh, finished that in a couple of years. And so I, but I knew my limits, right? I, I'm, a, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a good surgeon. Uh, I've never been a CEO. And so I, I, from an MBA, I know how it works, but I, I needed somebody with more experience. Fortunately, I have a, a, a good friend that is, has been a CEO, uh, has been in the medical device space. So we valued, he valued the product with me. Um, he found it to be valuable. And so we formed a company in 2019 together. Okay. And that's ASR Systems, Correct. right? Advanced Surgical Retractor System. Correct. Right. And it, this now this device, um, is it being used all over right now? Is, I, have you gotten to the point where people are using this across the country? Yeah, we've uh, it's being used at over 35 level one centers right now. Wow. Uh, so Ban- Brook Army Medical Center has it, U- University Hospital, UT Austin, um, Walter Reed, uh, L.A. County. A um, lot we started with a lot of the larger hospitals, uh, but no, they found value with it as well, and they're using it actively. Uh, and military active duty and. So, and- Military, yeah. So it's at Brook Army Medical Center. Uh, nice. They have it. Um, I have a lot of deployed surgeons that request right. it. Uh, when they deploy, it's really designed to, to work in any environment, whether it's a tent or a level one trauma center. And so uh, I, I do get requests uh, from surgeons to take it, you know, in their backpack. Uh, yeah, I would imagine. So this device uh, allows you to uh, to to basically retract the skin, retract, hold. I, I saw the video. Um, and that may be something, Soren, that we want to put in there, but it basically is able to hold things out of the way because if you don't have any other hands, if you're in the middle of the jungle somewhere, right, or in a, in a trauma hospital, even then, because the other ones were attached to the bed, is that right? Yeah, so there's a table-mounted retractors and non-table-mounted retractors. Okay. They each have their advantages and their disadvantages. The table-mounted are great because you can, you can support a ring over the patient and then attach other components to it to pull back tissues. Yeah. And you can essentially operate hands free. But that table system can take upwards of 15 minutes to set up. So it takes a long time, mm. especially if you have a sick patient in front of you. Uh, if you're not in an environment that has a table mount, um, like in the military, uh, yeah. then you don't even have that option. And then you're left with that 100 year old device that just isn't very effective. So what we did is really combine the table mounted and non table mounted systems without a table requirement. And so now you yeah. can use it in an aircraft, you can use it in a tent, you can use it at a level one trauma center. Wow. And, and so what is it? So as you are looking at this device, the ultimate goal is to grow this into worldwide, like get this across the world. Is that the ultimate goal? Hopefully. Yeah. Uh, I mean, th- there really hasn't been a lot of innovation in this space. Uh, that's really one of the reasons I designed it, because if I didn't, no one else, was, no one else had. Uh, again, yeah. Again, we use 100 year old equipment every day. <laughs> and so it just became very frustrating. Um, but yeah, uh, we have had interest from worldwide uh, surgeons. Yeah. Uh, right now, the company our company is limited really to U.S. and Canada. So we've sold okay. in Canada, we sold in the U.S. But we had interest from Mexico, from U.K., from Israel. Um, so there is potential there for for worldwide growth. That's 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 exciting. Yeah. So so again, I'm going back to this MBA. I'm thinking about this because you 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 felt like. And I remember you telling me this at the party. You felt like you needed to have that business experience, kind of like that that idea. 
Um, and I think about, you know, the leadership, everything that you learned in the military, you felt like I wanted to have this one, you know, I wanted to have this, this leadership structure outside of the military almost, right? Is that kind of the idea? Uh, I just wanted more formal training in, in leadership and, and running an organization. Okay. And so uh, one of the frustrations I had is coming from the military, which has such a leadership focus um, and education. Um, for instance, uh, in, in the military, uh, uh, in the Marine Corps, a squad leader, uh, you know, manages four or six individuals, uh, you know, fairly low, lower rank, doesn't become a squad leader until they go to squad leader school. Mm. But when I, when I found the civilian sector after I left the military is that that is not a requirement for most positions. And, nope. And, and, <laughs> and most are just either issued or, or people just walk into it. And so some individuals do it very well, but many don't. And yeah. it's, it's almost setting them up for, for failure. Yeah. And it's no different in medicine. And so when I, um, when I transitioned over to the University of Texas, I, I found that uh, there were a lot of physicians that were in management positions, but guess what? There is zero management training in yeah. medical school. You zero. become a very good doctor, yeah. but you don't become a very good manager. And so that, that leads to a lot of inefficiencies. Uh, a lot of unhappiness. And so the more I saw that, um, the more I felt that uh, some some way we need to integrate some of those educational lessons that are out there. Um, the companies have been doing this for you know, 60, 70 years that know how to manage it. You go to management school yeah. internally or externally. And so one of the reasons for getting the MBA is to get some of that knowledge and hopefully apply it to University of Texas or UT Health San Antonio. And in fact, as I was going through the course, uh, I was just shocked at the low-hanging fruit that was available on on how to easily manage individuals and conflict resolution and a lot of those issues I saw every day that some were managed well and some were not. Yeah. And so I actually was able to get funding from University of Texas to create uh, a program here at UT in San Antonio where I, uh, I partnered with the, with the business school at University, UTSA. And basically brought, uh, I, I selected 20 uh, physicians yeah. uh, who were interested in leadership, had a position of leadership, but had never been trained to do it. Yeah. And we'd have a communications lecture. We'd have a negotiations lecture, an accounting lecture. Wow. And they, you know, once a month, three hours from a PhD that yeah. has those uh, skill sets. Yeah. Uh, I gave them a battery of, of uh, personnel tests, uh, emotional intelligence. I uh, hired a um, executive coach for each one. Wow. To, uh, to get them from point A to point B. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? How can you be, make you a better leader? And so that program is still going on. It's in its, uh, it's in its sixth or seventh year now. Wow. What's that program called? Uh, Executive Development Program for Emerging Health Leaders. That is killer. And so, yeah, it's been very well received. Um, you know, in fact, uh, it, was, it was shocking to me uh, how much people had been wanting, wanting something like that. And they uh, needed it. And it just helps them do their job better, yeah. easier, more effectively, more efficiently. Yeah. And so that's been a very satisfying part of the post MBA uh, application uh, to develop that program and see that it was uh, so well received. And you did that. How far after your MBA did you start seeing like, oh, man, we could really take this into the medical field and really make some huge leaps. No, I started during the MBA. So, so during the MBA, yeah, okay. I was, uh, I was just really surprised at the um, the uh, the information that was available out there that can easily help uh, somebody run a meeting better, uh, yeah. how to um, counsel somebody better. And, um, you know, most of us just make it up as we go along. Yeah. Uh, when we have challenges in our, in our workplace and we're in a position of leadership. But there are, there are techniques out there that are yeah. easily available. So I, uh, the more I read about those, learned about those, I said, you know, I think we need these in medicine. And so I proposed the program to, to our dean and then yeah. to the University of Texas. How is it funded now, out of curiosity? How so, do they fund it now? So our dean Romas, uh, our dean at, at, at uh, UT Health San Antonio, is very supportive of leadership. Uh, so when I presented this to him, he was very supportive, and so um, he he funds that. Uh, oh wow! Out of his budget. Um, yep. So it's free for our our, uh, our applicants, our, our physicians. And is it a, like almost like a leadership certification when they're done? Do they kind of get like a like they're certified in leadership because of this course? We didn't make that into a formal leadership because okay. that presented its own challenges. I understand. However, yeah. we do fund five MBA uh, programs or five MBA applicants every year, and wow. so we started that in parallel. So there's the executive development program 
program for younger, um, newer uh, physicians in leadership positions. Yeah. And then for the chairs or uh, division chiefs, those are higher levels. Yeah, um, they have larger budgets, et cetera. We uh, support into our MBA program through UTSA, so they could go and get their MBA. Hmm? That's super yeah. cool. Yeah. Well, that's got to be really rewarding, you know. And now I think about it because again. You were working how many hours a week and doing your MBA? Talk about that because, it, and then you developed this program on the side. Yeah, yeah that was a that was a tough like, a few years. That'd uh, be ridiculous. And, and Ramon, gonna, like, come say, on! I have the most supportive wife in the world. Yes, you do. My wife, Aaron, uh, as you know, she is extremely supportive. Um, and uh, it was it was a challenge though. It was a lot of time. So it was a lot of weekends, nights. You know, going back and reading about corporate law, and, and it's really going back to school. And I wasn't working like a resident anymore, but you know, it was a full eighty hour work week that we normally work. Uh, so you know, it was just on my own free time to finish that up, and then and then and then starting up that new program was was so was an extra bonus. 80, 80 hours a week work. You're finding time to read corporate law, like in between. <laughs> I just, when I read that, I literally just thought, okay, we've got, you know, there, there's, there's type A, right. And then there's like, there's, there's like the ultra, like there's the super Saiyan levels, uh, right. There's the, there's that extra level of type A, not in a bad way, in like a positive way, because th that program that you set up is probably the shock waves of your leadership program at UT are going to be felt for literally the next probably 10 to 15 years. Possibly. No, 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 guaranteed. Yeah. When you teach people leadership, you know, I'm a John Maxwell guy. Mm -hmm. When you teach people leadership and you help them understand uh, uh, how to have conversations and you help them understand that that it's 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 about servant leadership. It's not top down. It's yeah. up. You know what I mean? And you have these conversations. It changes perspective. And then that ripples from that one person to all of the people that they're around. And then all of those people are looking and going, well, how did they? And then it ripples from there. That, man, Ramon, there's going to be people, you know, 10, 20 years down the road that are going to have a massively different experience with their boss because of that program. No, no, I would agree. You know, some of the feedback I'd received is... Um, you know, I did, I did get a personal or executive coach for all these individuals. And one of the questions they would ask is like, what are your five year, from 10 year goals and how do we get you there? And many of the physicians would turn to me afterwards and say, you know what? No one has ever asked me that question. And yeah. you know, that's just a shame. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's the reason I, I, I created that because those individuals will then ask their subordinates, you know, what, what do you want to do and how do we get you there? Right. And that question, think about that question, too, because I would imagine in the doctor world, in the physician world, I know why that question is probably not asked. It's because there's an, there's an almost like this mindset of they've reached the pinnacle of where their ultimate goal was. Well, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, it takes so long to get to where we're actually practicing, right? So most of us in, in medicine, especially with the longer fellowships, longer training programs, we're not in practice in our early 30s. And so right. that is a, a very long time to be in training and, and not going to practice. And then to go back and learn more, yeah, uh, that, that's, that's difficult. Yeah, uh, and that's not easy to do, especially now you have a family, you're starting your new career, and, and you've just done you know 20 years of training, and so uh, that that is a big part of it. But for those individuals that decide to do a combination of clinical medicine and some kind kind of managerial uh, a component, yeah. uh, it does behoove them to do some kind of training. And there are the, you know smaller programs available. You don't have to do a full MBA. Yeah, uh, but it just makes you a, a better leader. How long is that your program, uh, the the emerging leader? Uh, it's just uh, I made it very very easy. It's one year. One year. Uh, okay. You do one night a month. Uh, oh wow. One night a month for three hours. But it had to be manageable. That for, is for the reasons you just mentioned. No, that that is amazing. Yep. You know, um, I I did a uh, um, I've done cohorts uh, and whatnot. You know, when I, when I went and got my master's degree, and we did a mm -hmm. master's, and it was you know a couple of nights a week, and we were able to get our master's at the end as well as teaching. Um, but I could see something like that. There's leadership San Antonio, which is a, a leadership program between the Hispanic chamber and the uh, greater chamber. And they bring leaders in and then they have a leadership program that they put them through uh, for like, I think it's eight months. I do yep. think I do an eight month leadership, but that's fantastic, yep. you know, and I would imagine the, 
the the are all of them from the same hospital? Is everybody from the same hospital? They're all from UT Health. Santa. UT Health because the dean is now supporting it. So okay, uh, so uh, since he's funding it, it's it's his folks. So then the next question has to be: Is how do you get this in other hospitals because it's needed? Um, you know, that's, uh, it, it's available. Uh, it, it does take some, uh, effort and yeah. some time to set up. Um, other hospitals have reached out, uh, over time to okay. see if they could, uh, be a part of that. I'm not sure if UTSA, cause we partnered with their, with their school of business, which were great. They're very, very supportive. Yeah. Uh, I really love working with them. Uh, they may have developed other programs for other facilities. I know there are other organizations, not hospitals necessarily, that um, that do contract with them to provide some leadership. They provide, you know, they do have their MBA program, executive MBA program, which ha- with with physicians from around the city. Okay, and um, and so I think that's where uh, most of the other uh, hospitals get their leadership. Okay, they so they have a they, they have an outlet or they, way absolutely. to kind of do that. Okay, absolutely. that I I love that. So now. Your MBA. What do you think was the the takeaway? Because because what? How old were you when you started your MBA? Oh, uh, mid forties. Yeah, mid forties. Yeah. Okay, so and in mid forties to go back, you're you're doing your this MBA program. What do you think stood out when as you're doing this program that where you were like, this is why I needed to be here. So uh, of all the courses, uh, what I thought most most interesting was negotiation. Okay. Um, because there are techniques on how to negotiate. And we negotiate, we all negotiate every day with yeah. our, um, with our spouse, with our coworkers, uh, with our direct reports, with our bosses, there's always yeah. negotiation going on. Yeah. And so there are skills to do that. Um, and how to be successful that both parties win. It's not just, you know, me, me, me right. and, and, and pushing. And how do you get to that point? That's what I was really fascinated about mm. the most because, uh, again, in a hospital, we negotiate. There, are, there we have large teams. Uh, we have to um, get things done, um, and so it, it can be a little bit challenging sometimes. Um, mm. You know, especially when you're stressed with time, you're stressed with costs. You're, you're, you're it, it can be a challenge. So, um, being able to have a skill set that you can lean back on to be successful in what you need to be get done uh, just makes your day easier. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it allows you to, to achieve your goals. And so I, I think that was probably the most educational uh, aspect. And these are these are techniques that have been around, I know, for 50, 60 years. Yeah. Uh, it's just that no one had let us know in medicine that they exist. That's right. <laughs> they were holding the secret yeah, away yeah, from all yeah, the physicians. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that, though, because, you know, I I, I think I think back to, you know, I, I did my master's in education and I remember going through that and I, I, my bachelor's was in, I graduated in 99. And so my, my master's was five years later, six years later. And it was it, even in that six years, how much it changed, yeah. right? Like, the, like some of the ideas that originally that we were talking about when in my education field is now, well, we're thinking this and it's, we're going to talk about new math, you know what I mean? Yeah. And some of the, some of it was crazy. I will admit new math is a little crazy, but the ideas were, it's like, we're, we're, you're seeing things from a different perspective. Your, 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 your eyes are being open. And I would imagine that's kind of what the NBA did. And so now with your new company, what do you think are the, um, the, the, the biggest obstacles, what are you facing now oh. in terms of what you're doing as uh, 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 the chief medical officer? And, and really, you're, you're in sales, right? You're, you're selling, you're negotiating, you're using all your MBA skills, uh, 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 your, in, in, in those, those skills that you learned there, but, but you're also using a lot of your military experience as well. No, true. Yeah, so, you know, forming a company, a running company uh, has been very eye-opening, Um and so, and the MBA only allows you to know about concepts. It, it doesn't, yes. it doesn't um, guarantee success. Um, however, uh, we've been very successful so far. So we uh, formed a company in October 2019. And so we had to go through fundraising, uh, uh, research and development, regulatory with the FDA, um, and then commercialization, manufacturing, who's going to make this, you know, mm-hmm. make sure it's made the same way every time, make sure it works. So we went through that fairly rapidly. We we were with we were actually being in clinical use 21 months after we formed the company, which is almost unheard of for a medical device. Wow. So we've been very very effective. 
we're now at the point of commercialization where we're expanding. We're expanding our sales team. We just brought on two more um, individuals uh, this month. Wow. Um, How many total sales? We So we have distributors. Uh, we have, we've have we sold over uh, one and a half million uh, dollars worth. Yeah. Uh, and so, but we have 30 distributors um, and uh, three full-time individuals now. With the wow. Company. So we're growing. Um, you know, the budget challenges after COVID for hospitals yep. uh, has been a little bit of an issue with it's a capital sale item, which uh, means that they, you know, they have to purchase the, the product. It's not recurring. Yeah. And so that has been a little bit of a challenge, but uh, you know, the product works. Um, we have a lot of advocates and supporters throughout the country. As I mentioned, you know, yeah. the uh, military is bought into it. Uh, Canadian military is buying it uh, even. Uh, wow. And so it's being used throughout the U S and, and ultimately the products saving lives. And really that's the reason I made it to make yeah. the, the surgeon's job easier. Uh, I had enough challenges when I was deployed and here at home uh, with difficult cases and difficult exposures. This just makes my job easier, which allows me to do a better job. Right. And, 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 and life-saving in the sense that it, it's quicker. Yeah, absolutely. And so compared to those table-mounted systems, uh, I can essentially get into the abdomen and get control of bleeding within about six seconds. Where wow. if I use one of those other table-mounted systems, I have to set it up and, and, and construct it. And that can take 10, 15 minutes. And, and that might be the difference. Between, that's life and death, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah. you're t- six seconds to 15 minutes is a big difference if somebody has internal bleeding. Yep, it can. That could be a really big difference. Yep. Well, um, do you see if, uh, where maybe you have other devices, other ideas that have come because of what you've been able to create? Because usually when you invent one thing, the mind starts thinking, I would imagine it starts to open up to other opportunities. Uh, yes. Uh, so... You know, surgical exposure with retractors is only one challenge in the operating room for us. Uh, there are other challenges uh, which uh, have frustrated me throughout my career as well, yeah. and we're planning to address those. Uh, but until we develop those, it's to kind of hush hush. For right, me. I understand. So, yeah. yeah, but but there's definitely something that you're you're thinking about in terms of the future of other opportunities. Absolutely, that's super yeah. cool. Right now, we're focusing on this product and getting it, you know, commercialized uh, yeah. nationwide. And then uh, we'll jump into our next venture. And that, and that also provide revenue and sure. oper- right the 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 cash flow to because you learned that in MBA you know you got to have cash flow right you do have to have cash flow <laughs> that's right it's really important now did you notice um, leading leading in the civilian world and leading in the military world I'm just curious on your uh, perspective on that I think we talked a little bit about that in the party you know yeah. what was that what was that like yeah, for the, you uh, so it's different. Um, so in the, in the military, you know where you stand. It's it's based on rank or your either positional rank or or, your, or rank you hold, um, and it's just expected that that is your boss. Yeah. Um, and it's yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. Uh, in the civilian sector, that doesn't work as well. Yeah. Uh, so um, it, it it is you know you have to um, you have to just address it a little bit differently. Okay. Um, and so it is very much a difference. Uh, I, I enjoyed the military because of that. Um, that also was very frustrating uh, mm. because you may have a, you may be told is something that, you know, doesn't make sense, um, but you really can't push back on it. In the civilian sector, you, you can ask questions. Right, you can say, right. well, give me more information before I decide to do that. And so the military has to work that way, though. Uh, there, you know, sometimes it is a one or a zero. You kind of have to follow orders or, yeah. or, or things can happen. In the civilian sector, you, you don't typically have to, be under that kind of pressure yeah do you do you feel like from from leadership what was it easier in the military or do you feel like it's a little easier in the civilian world i think they each have their own types of challenges um you know it was more straightforward in the military yeah. just because of the rank structure and the culture um but in the civilian sector I, I think it can be just as easy yeah um it just you have to develop a different type of relationship with your direct reports yes yes you 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 almost I could I could sense it from a standpoint in the military. There's a natural understanding of the structure, and then in the civilian world, it, it's it's a little it can be ambiguous, right? It could be a little bit fluid, you know, uh, which is that presents a lot of challenges as well, right? So in 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 moving forward, now you're 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 teaching you a professor and 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 as the co-founder, like what is a typical day like for you? Like, what is your day like now? So I've uh, pulled back from clinical medicine uh, just so I could devote time to the company. Uh, it was too challenging to really uh, be on call at the hospital or, or run the ICU for a week. 
and then be available for my sales team yeah. uh, or physicians or surgeons that have a question or, or travel to a conference. And so uh, now I've devoted full time to the company. Okay. And so uh, my week varies, uh, you know, meeting with my sales folks, uh, performing training. Um, I'm gone for the next two weeks, traveling around the country, um, teaching ho- surgeons how to use it at different hospitals. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Once they purchase, we come in and, and we train them how to use it. Uh, we bring a, an abdominal model. Okay. Uh, I have a uh, presentation I give, answer questions, surgeon to surgeon, uh, make sure they're going to use it effectively. Okay. Um, some hospitals like to do trials, and so we come out and, and give them a presentation on before they use it uh, so they can test it out. Um, I teach courses for trauma uh, where I, we use a device. I, I teach for the Air Force. Uh, I teach surgeons how to operate in a tent environment. Okay. Um, so I do that several times a month. Um, so it kind of just varies. Sometimes I come here and, 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 and do, do podcasts. And, do podcasts. <laughs> and so right. the, the, uh, the point back from clinical medicine allows me that flexibility to do, you know, these other yeah. things that, that, um, that will ultimately help the company be successful. Right. For growth. I mean, okay. at the end of the day, you want to grow the company and, 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 and continue to create life-saving opportunity devices that can help uh, um, in in so if you when you look back on your military career what are the highlights what are the, what are those those moments when you look back and you're just like man like you it, it almost takes you back to that moment and you remember it that that really stood out to you so I had a very satisfying uh, military career. Um, I volunteered for all my deployments no one ever you know forced me to go to mm-hmm. combat zone. Um, so I think each deployment or each time, um, each new duty station presented its own benefits uh, yeah. or, or highlights, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, going to combat and, and being in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and taking care of those individuals that are really going out there and doing patrols in Iraq, wearing you know, 80 pounds of body armor in 135 degree weather, you know, doing a convoy, mm. uh, looking for IEDs, you know. I have an incredible amount of respect for those individuals. And so yeah. it's was, it was really an honor to be able to take care of those uh, individuals and, and hopefully get them home. Yeah. Um, so, you know, combat um, surgery really kind of, you know, uh, I, I have a, a lot of pride in what we did there. Uh, the camaraderie, uh, the friendships you make, the relationships you make, especially under combat, um, you know, where, you, where, where rockets are coming in and you don't know if that rocket's going to, going to, it's going to be your rocket that day. Mm. Um, you know, I'm glad those days are over. Uh, but you know, those, those are bonds that are, that are very, very strong that you, that you form with your team. Yeah. Uh, team, um, uh, you know, the team effort, uh, you know, working with other individuals for the ultimate mission of, of saving somebody's life, a soldier's life, from uh, a Marine's life, whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, just having that focus, um, you know, even though you're in the most austere environment you can imagine, you know, 120, 130 degree weather, working in a tent, you know, you know, you know, you're eating MREs. Uh, really, it, it's just, it, it's, uh, I have, I have great memories of that. Yeah. Um, same time, uh, you know, I do, one of the reasons I got, I finally decided to separate from the military is I, I saw Howitzer uh, rocket go over me about 20 feet and land behind a building about, uh, about 200 feet away from me. And this is in a, in a very large base, um, is in Kandahar, uh, and uh, they they fire rockets pretty frequently into the base. You don't know where they're going to land, but I actually physically heard it and then saw it. Um, wow. And uh, it was that time I decided I probably should um, should now retire. What year was that? This is 2012. In 12, so that was uh, that was after your NATO. Um, that was when I was in. That was in my, that was during NATO that hospital that, at Kandahar. the NATO hospital. Mm-hmm. Wow. So that, um, what built, did it hit a, a building, what building on base it, or just it off? It hit a separate building no one happened to be in at the time. Okay. But we, we would fairly frequently get uh, rockets coming in, uh, both yeah. in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, two, three times a week. Yeah. I, uh, you know, you, you, I think as a civilian, we don't really like appreciate, right, totally because we don't really know what somebody, you know, what a lot of these soldiers, what yeah. you went through, we don't know. And, and, um, there's a feeling of like, like, man, like I can't, I can't imagine. I can't yeah. imagine. Uh, and yet we, there's a, there's a gratitude, there's a thankfulness, like goodness, you know, um, because, um, 
you know, we, we could be in an environment where there's a draft. We could be in an environment where there's, you know, that it, it, it's not voluntary. It is, you know, you, you, you have to go. Um, and yet so many willingly, you know, uh, 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 just uh, they, they're like, put me, we're ready. I yep. mean, I have a, a dear friend that was, you know, one of some of the first in Afghanistan, a dear friend of mine was there. And um, he's he business here in San Antonio. He's in my in my EO group. But I, I sit there and I, I, I just even as I sit here right now, just so much gratitude. Like, yep. gosh, that's amazing. You know, and you're right. Those type of uh, uh, relationships are. How do you shake that when right. you've been through what you guys have been through? Right. You know. How do you? How do you? How do you take that away? You can't take those memories away. Yep. You know. No matter how what the temperature. Right. You know. No matter the sand or wherever you are, I can't imagine you can't take that away. Uh, and so wrapping this up, I, I'm curious for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so so somebody out there that's that's. Maybe they're 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 that physician that they they've never been asked like, hey, what do you want to do in five years? Yep. Now this is a joke with my wife and I because when when we were dating, that was always my my I was like, hey, five years from now, where do you see yourself? I would always ask her that. <laughs> and she would just look at me. She's just like, All right, you need to stop with this five years. But yep. we've been married twenty uh, three years now. And so it's always the conversation like, well, where do we want to be in five years? Where do we want to be in five years? And so I, I, I'm curious to like, what are you recommending? What books are you recommending to people to read uh, your, your counterparts, your other physicians? Because I sense that you have a vision for your company beyond just the next five years, that you have a vision of where you want to take it. And so what are you reading that you want to share with other people to like be like, you need this vision as well? Yeah, so, um, you know, specifically for physicians, um, there's a, especially academic physicians, uh, probably the best book I've read is called Research to Revenue, which really takes you huh. all the way from being a researcher or being a clinician, clinical physician into uh, selling your company. And it takes you through all the steps you need to, to go through fundraising, go through regulatory FDA. Um, how do you do your R&D? You know, what, what are the steps? Yeah. Uh, because, you know, there are not a lot of resources uh, on, um, on how to do this. And, and we've been very lucky. I mean, it's, it's been a lot of serendipity. Uh, you know, now you create your own luck, right? So, yeah, oh, for sure. And um, one of the things I've learned that I recommend is really don't over, uh, overestimate uh, your skill set. Especially mm. in this area, as I mentioned, you know, uh, the leadership component, most physicians have had minimal training in, in, in leadership, same thing for business. Uh, so a lot of them, a lot of my friends and, and peers, uh, have decided to form companies and, and some of it's success, successful, but oftentimes they run into challenges because they think they're going to do all the components, uh, the regulatory, the sales, the marketing, uh, the IT, uh, yeah. the CEO. And so I I know my limits. Um, I I dabble in all those. I try to help, but yeah. um, you know we have sales experts. Uh, my my co-founder is a CEO, and he's done that before. He's been in medical sales thirty plus years. Yeah. So he knows that. Uh, I don't. And so knowing your limits is probably my my biggest recommendation to a new entrepreneur, or at least in this space. Uh, and then going on finding the expertise. You know, find mm -hmm. someone who's done this before and does it well. Uh, it may not be cheap. But do it right that first time. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be undoing uh, problems, you know, yeah. three, four years down the road because you decided to save some costs here and there. Who did you find? Who was your? Who was that person for you when so you started? Like co-founder. Uh, in terms of like you said, find somebody that can help you. Was it the co-founder that can kind of? Was that the person well, for you? Uh, I was referring more to the specific skill sets you need. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. if you if you need a marketing uh, company. Find, Got it. Find a good one. It may, it won't be cheap. Um, yeah. but you know, and marketing can kind of come, you know, can be, uh, you can still be successful without an expensive uh, marketing company, yeah. but you're legal. You're the way you set up your company. If you want to be acquired yeah. five, six years from now, you have to set it up correctly now so yeah. that you're, you, you do it well when you, when you, when you exit. And so th those are the kinds of things is, uh, you know, find the expertise you need, um, yeah. and, and have them join you on this, on this path. No, I, I think that, I think that's massive for for because you you have someone that's been to school, you know, half their life, right? Almost, right? They've been to school, they've got a lot of knowledge. And there is this mindset I could see of just like, well, I, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. And 
I think to me, that's the biggest piece of advice for, I think, anybody that wants to start a business is don't overestimate your skill set. Don't overestimate what you think you can do. Find people, build it right in the beginning so that it flows to where you ultimately want to go is either either selling or or growing, right. you know. If you, right. if you don't build it well on the front end, and this is one of the things that I, I coach with people is I tell people you need systems, you need systems, you need systems. And the systems are what create the actual revenue that it is going to make your company successful. If you have no systems, you really don't know what creates the revenue, right. you know? Um, and that people forget that all the time. Yeah, and, and you know, the other one is the uh, adage that, you know, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it, right? Yes. And so uh, you need to get data, um, you know, uh, what works, what doesn't. And, and you really analyze what you're doing, what's effective, what's not. Because uh, if you keep redoing the same thing, you're having problems, you're going to expect the same results. Oh, for sure. Now, how does a guy like Ramon relax? Because I get the sense that you, you're you go, 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 and you're ready. Like like on vacation, are you the relaxed guy or are you the sightseeing guy? Let's go learn and go see what's going on. You know, it's a combination. Combination? Uh, so we scuba dive. Okay, there you go. Um, so we yeah. uh, we tend to wherever you know if we're in the Caribbean or anywhere on the beach, we tend to scuba dive. Okay, we, that's an early morning, so you're done by noon or one, and then now you can relax by the pool or, or explore the city or yeah. do another tour. Um, so that's one way uh, that we relax. Uh, okay, I exercise like you know, I'm, I'm sure most of us do. Yeah, um, no, no, a lot of people uh, don't. Uh, it's true, unfortunate. True. <laughs> True. <laughs> it's unfortunate in San Antonio. But what is a typical workout for you? What do you what do you what are you uh, into? So during the summer I swim. It's oh just, really? Yeah, it's uh so I, I swim and, and you know, uh try to get some swimming in every okay. day if I can. Uh some weightlifting. I have okay. a dog. I walk dog every day. Okay. Uh or I try to. Yeah. Uh but you know that the the heat just kind of limits your outdoor activities here. But during it's the tough. winter, um cycling, running uh, more out hikes. Okay. You know, my wife and I like to hike. We, we, uh, have paddle boards, so we tend to paddle board when it's better weather. Um, did you do any triathlons? Did you do any racing? When I was in college, I raced bicycles. Okay. And so I did some bike races. I was on a cycling team. Okay. Uh, I snow ski, so I was on a snow ski team. Um, but, uh, and I've done, done a couple, uh, Tri- biathlons back in the day. Okay. Yeah. But, yep. uh, no, I never really did the whole triathlon. Okay. Um, okay. But you swim. Swim. So you, I would imagine you got to be pretty fast. Uh, I don't know. Pretty, I don't really, uh, what I do just, you do 100 meters in? Do you know? Uh, you know what? Do you I, track it? I or just, like I just do time. I yeah, just you do, do time. time. Interesting. I just do time. And what do you, what do you I swam this morning. Yeah, did yeah, I, yeah, I did 1,600 meters this morning. Oh, I, yeah, I, 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 but I always just track it on my watch because I'm like a, I, I do the Garmin. So I, I always want to know what was my per hundred. Yeah. I'm always looking at my per hundred uh, meters uh, to see if I'm getting faster. Yeah. And yeah. I usually end up at the same. I'm like about 216 per hundred meters, yeah. you know, in ballpark. Yeah. You know, it took me 36 minutes. 1,600 meters is a mile, right? That's about a mile? I think so. Yeah, it's about a, right at a mile. Yeah. Anyways, I, I try to just swim straight the whole time, yeah. like endurance, yeah. you know, I don't want to stop because if I stop, then I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. You it's know? such a great sport. <laughs> it's the best. On the joints, it's it's the you best. stay cool. Yes. Uh, you come out refreshed. Uh, it doesn't feel like I worked out this morning, yeah. honestly. Yeah. Oh, I love it. You know, it's to me, I think that's the best type of swim. So how long do you swim for when you swim? Uh, about an hour. You'll swim for an hour. Yeah. That's, that's a good yeah. workout. Yeah. But uh, it's at a relaxed pace. I mean, I just, I enjoy it. No, no, I'm the same way. I'm not trying to break any speed records yeah. by any means. Yeah. Um, when I did my triathlon training, that I didn't yeah. know how to swim. I couldn't swim a lap. And so that's what kind of got me into yeah. it. And then once I started swimming, it's probably my favorite exercise now. Yeah. Do we, where do you swim at? You at Lifetime? No, so uh, we have a pool. And, at home, gotcha. Uh, so so now it's a stationary uh, swim. Uh, it's a, basically a bungee cord that you attach to Oh, yourself. get out. No, and so you just attach it to a fixed... Uh, uh, I have it. Uh, I have that system. Yeah, so I just... I swim. bought it during COVID. I, <laughs> I love it. I don't... Because, you know, to do laps, you have to find a lap pool. Yes. So this is just swimming against resistance for a certain time. Wow. You know, I tried it like twice i couldn't like <laughs> get i felt but for i'll do i'll uh, uh, you know to the people who made this wind bungee i did not <laughs> use it correctly i'm sure <laughs> but the reality is i couldn't swim really well at that time 
I was still using a lot of like buoyancy. I was using mm-hmm. the the swim uh, um, buoy. Okay. And so I still didn't have all it figured out like I have today. I'm sure if I did it today, it would probably be a lot easier. Yeah. It'd uh, be a lot great. easier. Yeah. Um, so scuba diving, working mm-hmm. out, and a, a big reader? You Big into reading? Uh, I read. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's usually... Uh, Pleasure books, yeah. Uh, unless I'm trying to read something, you know, uh, for business, yeah. Uh, mostly articles um, from business journals, Forbes, Inc., whatever it might be. But uh, but yeah, I just typically read something every day. Love it, love it. Well, listen, this has been fascinating. I love having you on the podcast. I'm glad we were finally able to make this happen. Best of luck to what you're doing and and and, and continue to success with ASR Systems, man. Super excited right. and enjoy the next two weeks. Right. Where's the first place where you get to go? Uh, I'm going to DC. DC. Yeah. Where are you going to stay in DC? Uh, I'm there. Do you one know night. yet? I'm there oh, one, one night. night. So uh, yeah, it's now just moving a lot from city to city. Yeah. Okay. DC. Um, we were just there, and we stayed at the Waldorf Astoria, okay. right downtown. It's okay. unbelievable. Yeah, it's great, great hotel. But you're going to be in and out, so yeah. you, you know, I you just need a bed. To the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> you just need a bed. Yeah. <laughs> well, enjoy it, and we'll be talking soon, my friend. Great. Thanks Take very care. much. Appreciate it. <laughs>